Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QB School. I am JT O'Sullivan. Today, we are talking about how to teach quarterbacks to get through their reads. Fired up for this one. Let's get it going. Welcome to the QB School. Before we jump into the video, quick reminder about the Quarterback School Patreon community. This group is the foundation, the bedrock of the channel. Not only has it never been cheaper to join, become a patron, there's more content over there than ever before. So get over there, support the channel, join. I appreciate the support. As for this video, the idea came from my guy, Ben Slife, at 4 Slife 0 or O, who knows, at JT underscore O'Sullivan. Uh, that's a little bit more of the non-football centric Twitter handle, a little bit more of my whatever Twitter handle. But if you come at me either there or at the quarterback school, question for the show, how do you coach up kids to get off their first read? I've coached in if then statements, but I'm not sure that's the best methodology for my young QBs. Ben, I appreciate the question. In fact, if you have questions and you're watching this, I'm always looking for great video ideas, so come at me in the comments, come at me through email, however you can, and I honestly do have a bank of kind of good video ideas that I've gotten either from email, from Twitter, from comments that I want to try to get to here as we come into the summer kind of lull of post-draft football world, so I'll get to those as much as I possibly can. As for your question, Ben, first, let's start with the if-then world. For me, I've never lived in that world, so I'm not necessarily uh, confident to say that it's, I'm certainly not confident to say that it's the best methodology. I think the first part to acknowledge is the fact that there probably isn't a kind of one size fits all kind of take on what the best way to teach this is. I'll talk kind of anecdotally what I thought as a player and then kind of how we did it at the high school level and how I think you can do it at even the highest levels. So the if then thing for me is a little bit too black and white. So much of this and so much of even just talking ball like this is living in the gray. And so being able to have kind of a communication structure to be able to talk to the quarterbacks to say, you know, why are we doing this? What is the intent of it is kind of the genesis, the foundation, the bedrock element of teaching kind of anything passing concept. Why for me is teaching the intent of the play. So let's just, for instance, do curl flat because many people know curl flat. An intent for me would have to not have it in the playbook because <laughs> coached three years of high school football without curl flat. But let's just use it as kind of a 101 passing concept. The if then statement for me would be, you know, if the flat defender gets depth or if the hook def curl defender gets depth, throw the flat. If the flat defender jumps the flat, throw the curl. Okay. That works in zone. Now what do we do versus man? Now what do we do versus bracket? Now what do we do versus different types of combo coverage? Pressures, zero. So to me, if then is just an kind of incomplete oftentimes approach to it. I think it can work for certain instances, but to live in an if then world is just not for me. So the first part, the original kind of jumping off point for me in any concept whether it's you're talking about getting through reads, and really this is more holistic quarterback teaching. Teach the intent of the play. So the intent of the play for curl flat for me would most often to be, the intent is to throw the curl. It's to get a good completion, but we're trying to throw the curl. If we wanted to throw the flat, we would run clear flat. We would run all stick. We would run all flat. So we're trying to throw the curl. If the curl isn't there, and you have to talk about what that means, and we will, then the ball needs to go to the flat. And most oftentimes, why is the curl not there? Because defenders get depth, because it's not the matchup that we want, because he doesn't win at the line of scrimmage. There can be, you know, X, Y, Z number of excuses about why the curl isn't there. But teaching the intent of the play, and that can be for anything, say for smash, say we want to throw the corner. If it's not there, we're going to throw the hitch. Uh, for four verticals, we want to throw a seam. If it's not there, we're going to throw the check down. So the intent of the play, and I think it's easy to do that at clinic talks, to do that like this in a video setting, but it's a lot harder to teach it to younger people, players who don't have a lot of experience, who don't know where the bones are buried with all these concepts. And so to make sure that not only are you explicit with the clear communication about what the intent of the play is, it's that they can also regurgitate it back to you and really probably teach it to the offense. So you hope that the quarterback 
eventually has the capacity to get up and install these concepts either to the younger quarterbacks, to the younger people in the program. That's how I kind of reinforce the that my teaching is making sense. Another little trick of the trade that I like to do at installations is the start of a meeting. I will say, hey, we for the next 30 seconds, write down everything that you remember from our last meeting. And it's not a it's it's a quiz, but we're not I'm not grading it. I'm not doing a lot of work on it. I'm just seeing what resonates. So are they being able to regurgitate what I think is important, what I want them to be able to play with on the tip of their tongue? If they're not, then I'm not doing a great job communicating. So the first element is just learning, teaching, and being able for them, the quarterbacks, to regurgitate the intent of the concept. The next element that I think is important, and some people think it's really important, and that's no shot at them, that's just the reality of how I go about it, what is open? So when you're saying get through a read, you have to know what is open, because if it's open, we want to let it rip, right? That's the intent of the play. It's open, let's r let it rip. For me, what is open can be different for every quarterback. So the way that I like to define it is can I make the throw where I'm supposed to, when I'm supposed to, and not have a defender get their hand on the ball? So I don't want to throw a jump ball, you know, potential interception just because it's where I'm supposed to go on the first read and it's when I'm supposed to go there. So can I fit it in that window? And what I can fit in the window might be different than what you can fit in the window and vice versa. And it can be different for different types of throws, big comeback to the field or deep post as opposed to a option route or something where I have to change my arm angle. So different open for different quarterbacks. I don't think that's that hard to understand. But can you put the ball where you want to put the ball, when you want to put the ball, and not have a defender make a play on the ball? That's for me what is open. And so being really explicit with the intent and now really explicit with what is open. The next part that I like to think helps quarterbacks understand how to get through their reads is and I, and I think this is, it's worth acknowledging the fact that what I'm about to say has become a little bit looser, but when I was playing and even when I'm teaching offense, I like to teach that the footwork is the timing mechanism to get you through the reads. So let's stay with curl flat. If we're going to go from gun and take a three-step drop from gun and try to throw the curl at the top of the drop, okay, we're going to take three and a hitch at the top of the drop our base is set to throw the curl. If it's not there, then we're going to quick hitch and get to the flat. Now, as you get better, you can really do that all in one hitch and kind of see it kind of as you drop. But just teaching the fact that whatever you're now, and now we're going to get away from curl flat and just go any concept, one, two, three, your footwork can be timed to the read so that the concept should be coming open and ready to throw as you're at the top of your drop. If it's whatever that drop is, we'll just stay gun three hitch. Okay, gun three and a hitch. When you make that first hitch, the ball should come out on time to the first read. If for whatever reason it's not open, well then we need to be to the second read. And then we need to be, if that's not there, we need to be to the third read. And it's not a big hitch heel clicky thing that you see me be critical of people on video. It's a tight reset. Some people don't even like to say hitch. I'm fine. It, it's just, it's semantics to me, whether it's hitch or reset, but you want to be in a powerful throwing position in your kind of all your cleats in the ground, great base, not moving around, bouncing around back there, but you have the capacity to slide. And so to be able to stay in rhythm with your timing and understand, hey, the footwork is going to lead us through the drop. And so if we're going to, if we're going to say, what's a good example? It would be, let's stay in the uh, curl flat world. So curl flat is the, is the primary concept. The secondary concept is we'll say like a sit over the ball. So it's going to be one to the curl, two to the flat. And really you could see those together as kind of one, two, three hitch. No, then it's down to the check down over the ball, sit or backside in two or three. And so your feet take you through it. That's the rhythm part of it. When you see people playing with great bass, great rhythm, they're getting their feet and eyes to where they need to be for the timing of the play. And the concept is designed well enough so that those concepts, you don't want your number three person in the progression to come open before the number one person does, right? So that's the design element of it. But just teaching the quarterback that your feet and the rhythm that you play with, the timing, first of all, 
that the drop, it's not recess. You don't get to go back there and do whatever the hell you want, I think, for most offenses. Now, some offenses are looser than others. But for the most part, at the high le- highest levels of ball, the drop is the drop. If you can't take the right drop, you're not playing quarterback. Like That's just it's that simple. You have to have the discipline to be able to do that. But from there, the base, the timing, the rhythm that you're playing with, your, your hitches or resets can take you through the read. And so that's the th- part that I like to kind of teach. Is, and you really does, it's not necessarily like a dance, but there is a flow to it. And when you're kind of playing with great rhythm, you don't feel rushed. You don't want to get through your reads too quickly. You don't want to get off your first read before that first read gets open. So you have to give them a chance to get open. And so all those types of things for me are tethered to your feet. So intent, what necessarily is open for you to be able to throw it to the primary read or any read. And then what's telling you to get through the progression? How can you help yourself? And for me, it's the timing the footwork, the rhythm that you play with from the ground up from with your base. And so how can you teach that? I think for me, there's a lot of different ways to teach it and I don't pretend to have all the answers. But I can tell you that what I used to do anecdotally as a player and as a coach is we would just throw spots. And so uh, I get out of this curl flat world. Let's go uh, smash with a backside like over or crosser and like a post curl as the number three. So smash number one read that hitch corner, we're trying to get the corner, okay, read that high, low, whatever, low, high, read the corner, I don't care how you describe it, that backside crosser is number two, and the backside kind of post curl is number three, well, you just go out there in individual, and you throw all of those, so you get the throw, so you go, you know, from gun, three and a hitch, one, two, three, boom, flat, or hitch, one, two, three, uh, corner, one, two, three, not there, smash, Get your feet over to the crosser. It's a there. Throw it. Next one. Smash is in there. Crosser is in there. Yes to the backside post curl or post. Those types of things, those are just easy, simple ways. I think it's even easier if you're at higher levels of ball and have a bunch of quarterbacks. You know, you can just rotate around. But at lower levels of ball, what I used to do is just I was the receiver. I would just go out there and stand at the hitch, stand at the corner, stand at the crosser, stand at the post curl, and just make sure all the quarterbacks get reps going through there and get as many throws as they can as they feel the rhythm of what that looks like. You do that, then you flip it over and just do the same concept to the other way. So whatever you're installing that day or that in that day in camp or whatever your focus is that week in practice, you just go through that in individual work their timing, work their rhythm. I think, you know, I make a lot of jokes about being certified on this channel, but one of my favorite things that the Air Raid does, and you really can only do this when you have a lot of people, some smaller school, you know, high school coaches, you know, if you don't have five quarterbacks, it's going to be tough. But if you have five quarterbacks who can throw in college and you have a bunch of wide receivers, you just have all the eligibles run the concept all the time. And I feel like that's how those air raid guys get so many reps working so many of those concepts. And then you just rotate the quarterback. So every throw, you just switch spots. It's what I think a lot of college programs do. It's a nice, easy hack to be able to kind of do what I was doing by myself by a little bit better by throwing to the actual wide receivers and you get all the quarterbacks going all at the same time so there's a lot less kind of wasted time standing around so lots of different ways to just manufacture that feeling of your feet timing rhythm that you're going to be playing with to be able to generate it so when you're doing that kind of routes on air you just don't drop back and throw the crosser you drop back go through the read go through the precision of your foot your feet your base your movement the way that you can maybe move in the pocket say the next time it's not a clean pocket say now after the first read you need a violent reset up in the pocket or violent slide sideways to find a lane so you got to drop down your arm angle get it to the check down you can create these different ways to make you know simulated pocket pressure and you can you see a lot of gurus kind of back up into the quarterback's way. So they're staying in rhythm, but they've got to move and manipulate the pocket to stay alive. So lots of different ways to kind of insert your own creativity into allowing your quarterbacks to get more and more reps getting through their reads. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the tricks of the trade that I like to do. Uh, This first one is one that I catch myself doing occasionally on this channel. And it's really when you're watching film with your quarterbacks or with your offense or however you're teaching ball, it's, hey, that's a great throw. That's a great catch if they're throwing to the first person in the progression. But from there, acknowledge the rest of the play. So let's pretend we didn't throw it to the first guy. Let's pretend like that wasn't open. Now let's play the play. Where would the ball go? 
Would it go to the number two? Would it go to the number three? Would you be able to stay at the launch point? Would you have to move, manipulate the pocket? Those types of things that I think you get extra reps. It's not just about kind of just having the film on and getting through the film. It's really about the nuance and detail of being able to watch the film and soak all the information you can out of it. So, yeah, it was a great throw to the number two. But if the number two wasn't there, say the number two fell, what else would the concept look like? Oh, okay, the number three is not there, but yeah, the check down is beautiful. All right, well, let's bank that so that when we come back to this, we know the check down looks good. Those types of things, I think, are how you can really kind of accelerate your learning, accelerate the quarterback's understanding of getting through the read by making every rep a full read. It's not just, hey, congratulations, you threw a beautiful ball. Yeah, that's the first read. That's where the play is designed to go. Great, congratulations. You know, all that type of stuff. Now, let's play the position how potentially, if it doesn't go perfectly, what it looks like. The other part that I never did that I wish I did, watching other guys do it at a high level from kind of being away from the game, I think of guys like Drew Brees, who I've seen throw it, say it's a rep in practice, throw the ball wherever it goes, then he goes through the read from the pocket after the throw. That's pretty next level. I really like that. I never did that as a player. I never necessarily asked our high school guys to do it, but I certainly think it's that extra step to get even more reps of getting through those progressions. So wherever you throw, say you throw it to the number two, well then after you throw it to the number two, work your feet through the three, the four, the check down, all those types of things. Just deeper reinforce the learning and the behavior and the pattern movements. Another little trick of the trade that I like to do is, especially in seven on seven, sometimes I think, I actually got to the point coaching high school football, we didn't even do seven on seven. But when you're in that seven-on-seven seven world, maybe kind of in those kind of deep summer days where you're competing against other schools, potentially at different levels, for me, sometimes I would say, hey, let's just not throw it to the number one read. The number one read is covered. And we're not going to tell anybody, but let's just, it doesn't matter. This is just seven-on-seven seven drill at some random practice. Pretend like the number one read is covered. Work your progression, work your feet, work your rhythm, your base. Maybe, hey, you've got to move off the launch point to get to number two. And so you incorporate all those kinds of real world things to make it just a little bit harder, make practice a little bit harder than the game. So you play the play. Say we're playing smash with a crosser on the post curl on the backside. No matter what, God, this smash is wide ass open. I'm just not going to throw it. We're not throwing number one, so no. Cross or two, no to the post curl, yes to the check down. And just work that rhythm, that flow of it in reps that, yeah, they matter. You know, seven on seven, we want to do our best. We're going to work our craft, all those types of things. But at the end of the day, sometimes you have to manufacture these kind of ways, the adversity to get through those kind of reads in situations that are football-like. One of the last things here I'm going to talk about is one of the things that I thought helped me a lot as a player. I tried to reinforce and instill with the players that I coached at the quarterback position, and that is this type of work, teaching people how to get through their reads, it's going to be really hard to get good at this, to master this, by only practicing it at practice. So you really have to teach quarterbacks how they can practice this on their own. And this is one of the few things, quarterback-wise, that you really can practice on your own. I think drops and I think getting through reads. Because you don't need a bunch of, you don't need five eligibles to get out there and go potentially throw it to. You can get through the reads, everything but the throw on your own. So teaching quarterbacks like, hey, the expectation here is that you're doing, you know, X number of these types of drops three times a week, getting through this read. So if we're, you know, we're going to install whatever, four verticals at the next practice, let's make sure you are going through this beforehand to bank you know, 25, 50 different types of drops getting through the read each time. So it's not just us out here on the practice field, but teaching them, hey, go to a field, get on a hash, get on a line, work your depth, get to the correct depth, work your base. You know what the read is now. Now actually bank those things so that it becomes seared into your brain. You have a kind of first like default understanding of, oh, I know the drop, I know the read, I know the footwork, I know the timing, the base to be able to manipulate it. And then I think you can take it to another level by being able to bank those kind of reps on your own versus specific coverages. So the I would just literally go through the list, like zero through nine. So we're gonna, let's stay with four verticals. Four verticals, I'm gonna do the drop and the read versus every coverage. So first one, zero, where am I going? Okay, I'm gonna take a drop and throw a seam versus zero. I'm gonna take a drop and throw an outside go versus zero. That's it. First cover one. 
I'm going to take a drop. I'm going to, I love my matchup on the outside. I'm going to take my three-step drop, throw a deep go. I'm going to take, now the next time I don't love my matchups on the outside, I'm going to take a three-step drop, hitch, and now I'm going to manipulate the middle field player to each seam. I don't like that. Now I'm going to, my next one is going to be three, manipulate the middle field player, check down. Do that for every coverage. So you're able to not only just get through the reads, but now we're incorporating coverage into it to be able to better understand what the timing of the visualization. I like to do that on a football field. I also like to move. So not in a static position, like don't be the clown that stands in between the hashes because football's not played in between the hashes. Go to a hash, work it to the field. Go to a hash, walk to the other hash, work it to the boundary. Those types of things to simulate what it's like to play and play the game. It's not cookie cutter on a whiteboard, you know, watching someone else do it on a video. You got to get out there on the field, do the drops, do the reads, work the pocket movement, and understand the timing, the base of getting through those progressions. So I really, 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 really think it's important to teach quarterbacks how to do it on themselves. Don't just say, hey, go get your drops, work your reads. Well, that doesn't mean much to a 14 year old or a 15 year old you got to give them a specific plan and anecdotally it's easy when you're or it's easier when you're a former nfl quarterback say hey yo this is what i used to do this worked for me you can build on it but here's a blueprint to be able to go out there and do it and now you have a blueprint of a former nfl quarterback to be able to say hey this is how i learned it this is how it became kind of muscle memory for me, go out there, incorporate this and build on it, make it your own. The final part of this for me that I used to use as a little hack was I would try to celebrate quarterbacks getting through their reads. So what does that mean? Yeah, it's one thing to say, hey, nice read, that a way to get through it to the quarterback. That's one way to do it. I think a more meaningful way to do it is to do it in front of his peers. So when we would watch film, when we would watch, say we have the seven on seven, the skill unit together, hey, Quarterback, that is a great way getting through the read. Or when you got the whole offensive unit there, you're watching a game film. Hey, quarterback, great trust and toughness to hang in the pocket. Little pocket movement, trust your protection, get through the read. You're doing your job at a really high level. Look at these other guys. Appreciate what we're asking the quarterback to do, all the trust, all the toughness to stand in this pocket and to be able to look down the barrel and deliver the ball where he's supposed to, when he's supposed to. It takes a lot of trust and you have to build that up and promote it. So that the quarterback understands how important it is to show that courage, to hang in the pocket. Yeah, you're going to get hit. Yeah, it's not always going to go perfect, but you've got to get up the next time and do the same exact thing like it never happened. And so for me, I try to celebrate that individually in the quarterback room, the quarterback meeting room, but then in front of the offensive unit, in front of the skill unit, in front of the entire team, in front of the entire offense, in front of the staff, all those types of things I personally think reinforce the importance of getting through your reads, showing the pocket toughness, all the great things that come from playing quarterback at a really high level. So that is a wrap. How to get quarterbacks off their first read. Hopefully you really enjoyed it. I had fun making this one. Thank you so much for hanging to the end. Again, let me know about your video ideas. If you have video ideas, leave them in the comments. I appreciate it. I will see you next time. Have a good one.